God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God. We thank the Lord for this is a time of deliverance for God's people. Amen. Uh, we're going to swiftly go into prayer. Amen. If you're sick in your body, if you need healing for your body, if you, amen, uh, need the spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, just lift your hands to God. Amen. Whatever your needs may be. Lift your hands to God. I'm going to pray a general prayer for one and all. Amen. Father, we thank you in the most holy name of Jesus Christ for now sick bodies are being healed. Amen. Now the spirit of God is being given to those that are reaching out for your spirit this hour in the most holy name of Jesus Christ. Above all that we can ask you, we ask for your spirit and your power to fall upon as many as are reaching out right now for the spirit and power of God. Those that were sick in their bodies that's been reaching out, your bodies are healed in the name of Jesus Christ. All discomfort is removed. Amen. All the maladies and infirmities in your flesh, amen, has been corrected, amen, by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as many as reached out for the spirit of God. Amen. All, all it takes the father is just a second and he can feel you. Amen. Quicker than you can blink your eye. We thank God for those that reached out in faith to receive the spirit of God, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be filled in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank the Lord and we praise him and honor him. Amen. For blessing us this hour. Amen. And meeting our every need. We've already met it when he hung on the cross. And now it is being manifest, amen, in this generation and at this time in the most holy name of Jesus Christ. So let's turn, amen, to, amen, the word of God for today. We're going to go back to uh, heaven, amen. And in order to talk about heaven, we have to talk about, amen, how the process worked. How did it work, amen, the way Jesus was able to attain eternal redemption for us. Amen. We need to understand clearly how that took place. Amen. So we looked at and we're going back to the Old Testament saints. You know, the plight of the Old Testament was that they couldn't enter into heaven. Not like the New Testament. The New Testament saint absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. Because Jesus, we, we're living on the other side of the cross. Jesus has come. He has died. Amen. He has shed his blood. Amen. And we on that other side of the cross of, of, of all that we needed for to, uh, to be done to have access to heaven was taken had taken place before we even came into existence. Jesus died. Amen. And shed his blood to give us access by his blood to heaven. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to go back to the Old Testament because they didn't have such uh, benefits. As we did, praise God. Amen. They uh, died before Jesus came, before he shed his blood. Amen. And so they didn't have access to heaven. And we're going to look at that. Amen. Uh, they had a place, but it wasn't heaven. Now let's look at the book of Hebrews. You get an understanding of some things. Uh, the third, the 11th chapter and the third verse of the book of Hebrews. Just want to point out something to you when we look at uh, the word of God here. Go ahead. The book of Hebrews uh, is going to be the 11th chapter, verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, I want you to understand that basically, amen, the Bible say the worlds, to let you know there's more than one, the worlds was framed by the word of God. So, there's only three worlds. We're looking at where uh, we can see life being manifest. Only three worlds. The one world is earth, the one that we live in. We all know about that. We have people here. We have seven uh, 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 billion plus people in the earth right now to show there's life on earth. But there's a Another place where we have life, and that is the is heaven, the intangible, 
We ain't talking about the tangible, but the intangible. I have to explain it that way because we're talking about, amen, the spiritual realm. We're talking about where God dwells. We're talking about where the holy angels are, amen, and where, hallelujah, uh, God himself is. And also, not just the holy angels, but now because of the blood of Jesus, amen, the saints are there as well. For absent from the body, present with the Lord. All believers that, that have died are with the Lord right now. And Jesus is going to bring those believers back when he comes. Amen. He's going to bring them back. Now, uh, Jesus talked about with his apostles, uh, one to be taken and the other left. Uh, uh, one to be in the field. Uh, 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 one will be taken and the other left. Amen. He was giving us a revelation of how uh, we would exit the earth because it's going to be we're going it's going to be a mixture of people in the earth. It's going to be a, that's why I say one is taken and one is left. It's going to be a mixture of those that have given their life to Jesus and those that had not. Of course, those that have not, when Jesus returned, will be left. Amen. And those who have will be taken. But then he went on uh, uh, and explained to the apostles. They said, where, Lord? They want to know where they're going to. And then Jesus began to talk about those that had died in Christ. And this is the way he said it. He said, where the eagles are gathered, or where the eagle, where the uh, caucus is, or where the bodies are, there will the eagles be gathered. So the saints are going to come back. They have died. Amen. They're going to come back and Praise God. Reunite with their bodies. It's going to be a resurrection. It's going to be a resurrection. My, uh, 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 my, one of my brothers, when he got saved, had a dream. And the dream was he seen from a distance look like a flock of birds. But when they got closer, he said there was people. There wasn't birds in the sky. And I said, you just had a revelation of what Jesus said when he said, wherever the eagles are are gathered or where the bodies are there where the eagles be gathered so then the saints will come back and reunite with their bodies for the bible said the dead in christ shall rise first and then they which are remain talking about those amen that would be still alive will be caught up together to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord now because we're in the new covenant when saints pass at this point they go to heaven jesus said if any man serve me him will my father honor and where i am because he's in heaven there will my servants be also so we know it's a it's an automatic praise god uh entrance into the presence of god at death for those that die in christ automatic that's why paul said absent from the body present with the Lord. But that scripture uh, was not found under the old covenant. For when they died, they was not present with the Lord after that. They had to go to a place because they didn't have access to heaven. So we're going back to where we left off at. And I explained that at the death of Jesus, he descended. At the resurrection of Christ, he ascended. But we was looking at when he descended. He had to go somewhere. Where did Jesus go when he descended? Amen. When we look at uh, scriptures like uh, the book of uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter, when Jesus talked about Jonah. Jesus says, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well. So shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So for 72 hours, he had to go to a location which he referred to as the heart of the earth. Now, Paul referred to it as the lower parts of the earth. And then another time he referred to it in another way. When he was hanging on the cross, the thief said, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom, Remember me. And Jesus said this day. Because he knew that he was ready to leave his body. On that day he was going to depart from his body. On that day he was going to experience death. A departing when the spirit departs from the body. 
But the spirit, when it departs from the body, it must go somewhere. It must go somewhere. So in this case, because the old covenant was still in force, everyone that died uh, in that died, amen, in righteousness would have to go somewhere. They would have to descend. As Jesus, being under the old covenant, he died like any righteous man under the old covenant would die. He would have to descend. But he was shedding his blood on that cross so that, that the Old Testament saints and also the New Testament saints would have access to heaven. Because at first there was no access. But through the blood of Jesus, we gain access to heaven. Amen. So let's look at uh, Ephesians the uh, 4 and 8, going back to where we was at on last week. We're still looking at heaven, but we have to look at the process of how it took place, especially for the Old Testament. We need to understand the importance of the shed blood of Jesus. The shed blood of Jesus Christ, amen, was not just given for the New Testament saints, but also given for the Old Testament saints. Because without his shed blood, no one would have access to heaven. So though, amen, the Old Testament saints would die and leave the scene, most not understanding the Bible would think that they went to heaven. They would think when Abraham died, he went to heaven. They would think when Isaac died, he went to heaven. No, he didn't. They couldn't gain access to heaven because they needed the blood of Jesus. So this is one of the reasons why Jesus makes the proclamation that I am the way. I am the way. In other words, nobody is going to get to heaven but through me. So then Jesus could rightfully say, I am the way. There is no other way to enter into heaven but by the blood of Jesus. So if someone could enter heaven without the blood of Jesus, then Jesus could never say, I am the way. He knew without his shed blood that, amen, the saints of old, amen, the, under the old covenant, amen, will be locked into a location that they would not be able to merge out of without his shed blood. And we're going to talk about that location. That lower part of the earth. That heart of the earth. We're going to talk a little bit about it. Amen. As Jesus called it even paradise. It was called the heart of the earth. It was called the lower parts of the earth. It was called paradise. But it wasn't heaven. It wasn't heaven. It wasn't the place of God's throne and his seat of authority. That it wasn't. But it was a place that God had, had, had prepared for those that would die in faith. Waiting for Messiah Jesus to come on the scene. Because only through him could anyone have access to heaven. So look at Ephesians. The uh, fourth chapter and eighth verse. Go ahead. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he left captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now watch this. Paul first emphasized his ascension because everybody's aware of that. But one thing most is not aware of that he could not ascend until he had descended. Because his mission was to rescue those that had died in faith under the old covenant from a location that they was bound in and could not, amen, praise God, leave until he had came. And this is why the Bible says when he ascended, he led captivity captive. Now, Paul, when he got to that point of saying he led captivity captive, where was they captive at? Where was their captivity? 
When the Bible said he led captivity captive, it's simply saying he brought the Old Testament saints out of captivity. They was in a location that they could not free themselves from. It would take the blood of Jesus to free them from this location. Now, it wasn't a place of torment. It was a place of comfort. But nevertheless, it was a place that they couldn't get themselves out of. That's why the Bible talks about them being led out of captivity by saying he led captivity captive. He took the captives, in other words, out of captivity. But in order to lead them out, he would have to go down to where they were. So then he descended to the place of captivity, a place where they was, amen, bound to, awaiting his coming. And we read it, amen, in the, I believe the 14th uh, division of song where the Bible talked about how he would turn the captivity of his people. And in that Jacob shall be glad. And Israel shall rejoice. Because he would have to descend. Into the place of their captivity. So the process of them going to heaven. Will first have to start with them being brought out of captivity. Let's read the book of Luke. To give you an understanding of this place of captivity. Uh, we want to look at Luke, the 16th chapter. And we're going to pick up this story, amen, about the uh, rich man Elijah to give you an understanding. Uh, the 16th chapter, starting at verse 19. This will give you an understanding of uh, what we're talking about. Jesus explained it very well. Had not Jesus, amen, spoke this word to us. No one would have clearly understood what was going on during the time of the Old Covenant. At the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant, nobody could go to heaven, praise God, although they, they died in righteousness. They died in faith, believing. Amen. And they had committed their lives. Amen. And had surrendered their lives unto the Lord. But yet they could not enter because there was no access to heaven prior to the blood of Jesus being shed. And through his blood, heaven will be accessible unto us. So let's look at the 19th. Get you a little understanding of what was going on back in under the old covenant. The 19th verse of the 16th chapter. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Now watch this. This, this is being given to us. That we may be enlightened. Otherwise we wouldn't have a clue. What would happen to Old Testament saints. Those under Old Covenant. Go ahead. And fare sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Which was laid at his gate. Full of swords. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs. Which fell from the rich man's table. Now one thing to say about Lazarus. Though his plight was really rough. Though he was a beggar, he was a righteous man. Though his situation, his condition was terrible and awesome. And that most people, even today, looking at his situation, would not think he had favor with God. But you better be careful who you condemn. There could be somebody out there living on the street that belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't even know that. And in fact, there was an evangelist. That came to a church. And you know nobody really. This evangelist that was coming. Uh, he was sent to them. So they didn't know how he looked. So what the, what the evangelist did. He was moved by the spirit of God to do this. He dressed himself up as a beggar. And sat in front of the church. And people stepped around him. Stepped over him. People basically. You know, ignored him. But he was at the church, at the door, begging. And they didn't see him as a beggar. They went on in. And then once everybody got in, 
he changed out of that outfit and put on his his preaching clothes. And when he went in there into the church, they were so ashamed because they realized this man of God was sent by God to show them something. How did they basically condemn them and and basically probably no doubt considered him not even to be saved. But this would be the same man that would preach the word of God to them. All wasn't their shame because not one of them showed mercy. So don't think that the rich man is no different from the average person out here that have no desire to help anybody but themselves. And probably thinking that Elijah was, was probably a nobody and there was no reason to even consider him. But yet he was God's child. Do you know the blessing that will come your way when you reach out to help a child of God? You better ask God for discernment. You may see one on the street, don't even know this child of God. I seen a beggar one day, he was out there praying, and he, he, he just blew me away. I was listening to him. And he was talking, because he, he was trying to witness, but, you know, nobody, wasn't nobody listening to him. And he, he started saying, he said, Daddy, that, Daddy, they don't want to listen to me. Oh, Daddy. And it blessed me, because he kept calling uh, uh, Jesus Daddy. He kept referring, instead of the saying Father, he kept saying Daddy. Oh, that was moving me, praise God. Because he was showing he's so close to God that he refers to him as Daddy. He said, Daddy, they don't want to hear me, Daddy. They don't want to listen to me, Daddy. And there is some righteous people out there that nobody want to listen to them because of their appearance. But you may be like that rich man. You may land yourself in the wrong place because you have denied God's servant and God's child. But look at this. Keep reading. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Now, was, if, if you look at this, pause for a second. If you look at this, the dogs had more compassion than the rich man had. The dogs came and licked his sores. Do you know when I was coming up as a kid, my grandmother taught me that there's healing in the tongue of a dog. And I, I didn't believe that stuff. I say, I ain't let no dogs licking on me. But she used to say, if they lick your wounds, you can be healed. That's what my grandmother used to say. Now, if there's any truth to that, maybe they was trying to heal uh, Lazarus by licking his sores. They felt sorry for him. They had mercy and compassion, but the rich man had none. Now, if dogs can lick the wounds of a man because they feel sorry for him. What in the world is the problem with those who God has blessed but don't have mercy on nobody? That was the rich man's plight. That was his plight. Go ahead and read. Go ahead. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. Now, if you notice, when he died, the angels came. The Bible never said the angels took him to heaven. That was an assumption on our part. The angels came and took him to a location where Abraham was. He went to the same location that Abraham went to. So then basically, the Bible used the term Abraham's bosom to note that he was in the presence of Abraham. Same location Abraham was at, Lazarus was taken to. And the angels escorted him there. But it didn't take him to heaven. Keep reading. And in hell he lift up his eyes. Being in torment. Now, when we talk about Lazarus, then we come back to the rich man that died and lifted up his eyes in hell, in torment. Keep reading. And see if Abraham are far off. Now, watch this. There's a reason why he can see Abraham. There's a reason why he can see Abraham. Remember, I talked about uh, uh, 
there's three worlds. There's only one, only there's only three worlds, and you only can be in one or the other. Earth, heaven, and hell. I didn't get a chance to finish that because we stopped off uh, on the earth. But when we look at three worlds, God created, formed three worlds. One was the earth. One was heaven. And one was hell. Those are the three locations where you find life. Where you find life. Where you find life existing. So in essence, we had a place that this man had to go to. No one could go to heaven because the blood of Jesus hadn't been shed yet. So there was no access to heaven. So after the earth is only one place for everybody on the old covenant. And that would be Sheol, as in Hebrew. Sheol, a place of the dead. It would be hell. But watch what, did, what happens here. He sees Abraham afar off. And what happens is a conversation, a dialogue is going to take place here. We, we need to look at a dialogue. Look at this. Keep on reading. And Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Keep reading. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now watch this. This is where revelation and understanding will come. Abraham said there's a gulf fixed. In other words, Abraham is showing us that there is a border. There is a border. So if you look at it, amen, when you look at a border, a border will divide, amen, uh, let's say one country from the other. Or a border can divide a, 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 a one place from the other. To give you a good example of that, when you Look at this island that has two nations on it. It's an island that shares two nations. And there's a border that divides one nation from the other, but yet they're on the same island. Gulf is used as, an, as a border. You know, when we talk about water, we say the word gulf. But Abraham uses this to explain that there's a border here. And this border for Abraham and this other guy, now watch this, is, is a border that separates the righteous from the unrighteous. So though they're on the same island, we're still not really quite on, in the same location. Meaning that there's a border that's dividing us where the portion of the island where one group may be, there's a portion where the other group is. So then, to give an example of that, we have Dominican or Dominica Republic and we have Haiti. They share the same island. But yet there's a border that divide the two nations. So then one will go to Dominican and say, well, I just went to Dominican. Basically, you st you're only on one island. You're in Haiti, too, at the same time, but you don't know that. But they put a border there so that one side of the island is Haiti and the other side is Dominican. Now, Abraham and this man is in Sheol. But there's a border that separates the righteous from the unrighteous. Because there's only three worlds. They can't get to heaven because the blood of Jesus hasn't been shed yet. The earth, they have passed and died, so they can't remain in the earth. So there's only one place for them to go, and that's Sheol, which we call hell. 
But hell had two groups of people. But God put a gulf. He put a border there to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And where the unrighteous went, you see that God refers to it as hell in the sense of torment. Because the man lifted up his eyes in hell. But Abraham explains that Lazarus on the other side is in comfort. We can see each other because we're on the same island. But there's a gulf. There's a border that keeps me from getting to you and you from getting to me. God put it here so that you can't cross over to me and I can't cross over to you. He put a border in place. So then the, 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 the rich man could have a conversation with Abraham. And Abraham said, remember, but there's so many things that were said in this conversation, this dialogue, to show you Amen. Something about this man that was rich. The man consistently referred to Abraham as father. At the time, there was only one group in the earth at this time that recognized Abraham as father. And that was the Jews. So this man is revealing to us there's a Jew in hell. There's a Jew in flames. There's a Jew that's being tormented because this Jewish man, amen, and Elijah, and watch this. The Jewish man had a responsibility under the law. Under law, the Jews would have to take care of the poverty-stricken people. Anyone that was rich was obligated to take care of those in poverty. Now, watch this. The Bible also explained that the one that's poverty stricken, the way that he make his needs known, he stands at the gate. This is in the writings of Moses. Elijah is at the gate. He don't have to say, give me help. Just being at the gate lets you know he's in trouble. The rich man ignored that. Violated the word of God, violated the law, and because of violation of the law, he ends up in hell and torment. He ends up on the torment side of Sheol. He ends up on the other side of the border when he should have been on the border, other side with the righteous. Had he had done what the law had commanded him to do, but he failed to do so. And because he couldn't love his brother, he ended up in torment. Lazarus was his brother. He stood at the gate according to the law. That's what, what the, your poor brethren had to do. The Jewish people knew if they're poor brethren, stand at the gate, meaning that you're wealthy. I'm not. I'm asking for help. Just stand at the gate. You know, there's some people ain't going to tell you to help them. They're going to show you they need help. And you waiting for them to tell you or say to you, you know how we ask people, we say, do you need any help? Don't ask them that. If you can see that they're in trouble, just go ahead and help them. Because it's very hard to ask for help. And you know that. Most of them are going to say no when they need the help. Don't ask nobody you need help. If you see they need help, give to them. If somebody, amen, is not working, you don't need to ask them, do they need help? They don't got a job. You know they need help. They can't pay their bills. What you doing asking the question? You need any help, just give me a call. That's a cop out. You like the rich man. You hell may be your portion. Because you don't love nobody but yourself. But when you see people in trouble, you don't supposed to be asking them, do you need help? Let me know if you need help. They don't got the courage to ask you. They're standing at the gate. They like lodgers. They're showing you by their situation. I'm at the gate. I need help. And sometimes they're going to turn to, amen, the world for help. There could be people in Christ, and they got to go to the government to get some help. The government is like the dogs licking their wounds. Don't let the dogs lick the wounds. You go in and hurt and, 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 and bind up those wounds for them. You don't got to beg the government for cheese. You don't got to go to the government to get help. You in the body of Christ, turn to the church, and those that have love in their hearts will help you. That's what saved folks are supposed to do. Saved folks are supposed to turn to saved folks for help. 
You don't supposed to go to the government and try to get on a program. And they might give you that program. But the sad thing is, your brothers and sisters failed to help you. But in this story, we see that in Sheol, there's a gulf. There's a dividing line between the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous had no choice but to go to Sheol. Let's turn to the book of, uh, in fact, let's turn to the book of uh, Psalm, 16th Psalm. To show you some things. We're about to come to a close. Amen. But but look at this. I just want to give you a little more enlightenment about what Jesus had to do. He he went he went he had to descend. He had to go to Sheol. Because there's only three worlds. He had no other place to go. Once you leave the earth, if you descend, the descending represents Sheol. The ascending represents heaven. He descended. He went to Sheol. He went to the heart of the earth. He went to the lower parts of the earth. He went to hell. Sheol. Let's, let's go to the 16th division of Psalm. And let's look at the ninth verse. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Now watch this. You ain't going to leave me in Sheol. <laughs> I know because he's an Old Testament. Amen. He under the Old Testament. He understand where the Old Testament saints will go. It sounds terrible because we, we didn't know the hell had two departments. We think of hell that if somebody go to hell and under the Old Covenant, we think that they just in torment. No, no. Hell had two departments. They had to go there. Until Jesus died on the cross. They had to go to Sheol. But God provided a gulf where they could be on the comfort side. And not on the tormenting side. The tormenting side was for the wicked. Those that would blaspheme. And those that would deny the right for God to reign over them. And to, for God to be their Lord. So when they denied. Amen. Uh, their creator. Then they end up on the side of Sheol that's tormenting. The tormenting side. The side where they be in flames. But those that died in righteousness under the old covenant, this only happened under the old covenant, they end up on the side of Sheol that was a place of comfort. They had different names like Abraham's bosom and meaning you're in the presence of Abraham and and paradise, because that's where this, the, the people of God was. It became paradise because God's people was there. And it was also uh, called other things we find in the scriptures. But the thing of it is, uh, it was not heaven. That's the point we have to make. David knew that at death, he would have to descend. So he said, thou should not leave my soul in hell, because that's the only place for them. Can't go to heaven. Once you depart from the earth, amen, under the old covenant, you're going to Sheol. You're going to descend. You're not going to ascend as Jesus had to descend like all the Old Testament saints would have to descend. So he descended on the behalf of those under the old covenant. He had to go down to bring them up and out. So he Descended. He went down to hell. Praise God. He went down to hell, saints. David said, thou should not leave my soul in hell. Oh, my God. You're not going to leave me here, are you? Praise God. You're not going to leave me in shield, are you? That's why my flesh can rest in hope. Because I know, praise God, that Messiah Jesus is coming and he's going to bring all of us out of Sheol, out of hell. Praise God. Out of Sheol. So read that verse again. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now see, here's the thing. David, as an Old Testament saint, he knew, he knew that he had to go to a location. 
But he knew that he wasn't going to be left there. But also in the prophecy of Christ, Jesus himself would have to go to this location. He would have to go to Sheol. And so the prophecy concerning Christ, that no, he ain't going to stay there. But he only was going to abide there for three days, as he stated. He said, listen, as Jonah was in the belly of the well, three days and three nights, so shall I be in the heart of the earth, or I can say in Sheol, for three days and three nights. After 72 hours, then he's going to lead captivity captive. And he, he was the first to go down to Sheol and come out, praise God. Everybody else wasn't coming out without Jesus bringing them out. Here Jesus go down into a place that nobody could get out of. And he brought his people out of it. So he goes down to Sheol. And then he brings them up and out. He resurrected. And then he resurrected them. And through the resurrection... They are always re received out. Let, let's, let's close in the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew, the 27th uh, chapter of Matthew, in verses 51 to 53. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now, these are Old Testament saints. Jesus, he went down to Sheol for three days and three nights. Then he came out of Sheol. He resurrected from the dead. He resurrected from the dead. And then, he's being the first, because he's the first resurrection. Then he raised them from the dead, those under the old covenant, he began to raise them up from the dead. They was raised after his resurrection because he's the first resurrection. He is the first one to raise, uh, was resurrected from the dead. He's the very first. Now notice, uh, he raised them from the dead. But in essence, Jesus told us how he's going to get up. He said, no man take my life, but I lay it down. He said, now I have the power to tick it up again. So basically, he's telling, telling us he's going to raise himself from the dead. He said, he's going to lay it down. He said, he's going to take it back up. So then he, he comes up from the dead. He's resurrected. And then after his resurrection, then he began to raise others from the dead, which was the Old Testament saints. So now when we look at uh, what is revealed in this scripture, we see that he's now bringing them out of captivity. 51 again, go ahead. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city. Now, here's a reason for why. Listen, now watch what happens. They're raised from the dead. And then they go into the holy cities. Or which is Jerusalem. Why are they walking around Jerusalem? There's a reason why they are walking around Jerusalem. It, it, they are on display. They are on display. Jesus rose them from the dead. He brought them out of Sheol. He raised them from the dead. But the reason why they're walking around is because they had to wait until Jesus would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle his blood. And when he would sprinkle his blood through the blood of Jesus, everyone would then gain access to heaven. So we call that, I call that a layover. The, destin the destination is heaven. But because Jesus would have to be resurrected and then go to heaven and to sprinkle his blood. So that his blood would be the access and the entrance into the holy place or into the holy of holies, which is heaven itself. So Jesus basically would have to, amen, sprinkle his blood. 
He would have to enter into heaven as the high priest would do and sprinkle his blood on the behalf of the people. The blood, now, the high priest would go in with the blood of bulls and goats, but Jesus is going in with his own blood. And then he would sprinkle that blood to give them access to heaven. So then they are waiting for that to take place. This is why they had to stay in Jerusalem. Too. He would go in as a high priest into the holy place and sprinkle his blood as the high priest did of old. They would go in the blood of bulls and goats, but Jesus goes in with his own blood. Amen. So that we can have access to the heavens or to the, uh, the, uh, the holy of holies. So now when we look at this, we will see that basically they are waiting for his entrance into heaven. Once he enters, spread his blood, then they can enter. They did it on the earth. The high priest would do it on the earth with the earthly tabernacle. But Jesus is going to the heavenly tabernacle that's not made with hands to sprinkle his blood to give them access. So many of the saints uh, that had died was raised up and walked around the streets. Keep reading. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. We're done. We're done right there. We bless the Lord for his word. Now, this is just helping us to understand the process that was necessary for the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints could not go to heaven without Jesus first descending to the place where they was at, which was Sheol. And then once he took them out of there, he, you know, see what happened was he would have to come himself, resurrected, and then and then raise them from the dead. They would have to be resurrected as well. This is where the Bible talks about leading, leading captivity captive. But he would have to descend before he ascend. So all of this was necessary for the Old Testament saints to understand that none of them died with the right to go into heaven until the blood of Jesus came. And through his blood, now we can enter into that holy place, which is heaven itself, through the blood of Jesus. So he descended for the Old Testament saints, rescued them from Sheol, from hell. That's why David literally said, thou should not leave my soul in hell. The prophet said that because he's indicating the place that all those that died in faith would go. But because Sheol had two locations within that location, meaning that it had a gulf to divide the righteous from the unrighteous, that basically they was at the same location, but at the same time they were separated. From the place of the righteous and the place of the unrighteous. So all of this was a revelation given to us by the mouth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he told the story in the 16th chapter of Luke. Had he not told that story, we would not even understand what was going on. Why now Abraham can talk to this man and this man can talk to Abraham and they both are separated from each other. But yet they can have a conversation. They have a gulf. They have a border. But yet we can have a conversation. Because they both was in Sheol. But one was in torment. And one was in comfort. For the righteous, Sheol was a place of comfort. For the wicked, Sheol was a place of torment. With all being said, maybe some can see some things in this and this whole understanding of what happened for the Old Testament, maybe some may not. But just understand that Jesus would have to descend in order for the saints of old to have access to heaven. Shedding his blood and then going down to rescue those that died under the Old Covenant. That died in faith. His people. By the shedding of his blood. So now the Old Testament 
and the New Testament have access to heaven by the blood of Jesus. Now we can say without Jesus hanging on the cross, the Old Testament or the New Testament saints would have never had a right to heaven. So you can understand the power of his cross, the power of his blood being shed. Understand it was not just for the New Testament saints, but Jesus' blood was shed for the whole, amen, uh, family of God, both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. No matter what place they found themselves, we all needed the blood of Jesus. Now, on that note, amen, I want to say to you, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God bless you.